Gary Thielman, Frank Wells, nice to see you. Nice to see you. Welcome. Welcome to Harris. Thanks. Well, let's talk a little bit about Nashville, your your home base. Now, um, Dave Harrison was originally in the studio business in um, Cincinnati, was it? In Cincinnati and down in Florida a little bit. That's where he met uh, G. Parnett. Mm -hmm. And then he had his studio uh, supply company here in Nashville. And and he needed e equipment to put in. He wanted to turnkey studios, and they were actually pretty successful at that. But, you know, in the 70s, there was not a lot of commercially available equipment that dealers could buy, resell, package, and kind of turnkey a studio situation. And, you know, his initial console um, foray was with MTI. He, he licensed to them a, a console design that he thought up and, mm -hmm. and they made it and, and he sold it and they built studios with those consoles in the early 70s. 75 was Five. when the first console was okay. produced and, and went to audio media here here in town. And then of the 20 in town, name a few of the studios that they went to. Uh, Don's Place, Audio Media, mm -hmm. um, uh, Tom T. Hall had a console. The Oak Ridge Boys had a console up there in, uh, mm -hmm. in Hendersonville. Leon Russell had his console up there. The, uh, the Nashville Network for, had two or three of these music consoles that they used in the performance, live performance rooms out at, uh, out at the Nashville Network. That was, that was early on, maybe in the early, early 80s, maybe in the late 70s. Um, scene 3 mm -hmm. had a console, the Castle mm -hmm. had a console down there. Chips Moment had the console here in town. Audio Media had three consoles. Mm -hmm. um, okay. um, so it was a local, really a local thing mm -hmm. and over the next two to th three years uh you know 20 studios here in nashville had put these consoles mm -hmm. in so there is a, a period of time in a in the burgeoning studio business here in nashville where it was quite prevalent the Harrison thing really was part of the studio sound I, I wouldn't say that Nashville sound which was kind of the musician the kind of thing that had that, that had come through the 60s and the early 70s but the studio mm. sound what they were doing technically in the studios uh, absolutely uh, David and, and Harrison had a big role in that you know all that old Steely Dan stuff. He, he worked at the Village Recorder. They worked on that, that Harrison console at mm -hmm. the places out in L.A., at Westlake, at all over, all over the time. It was, and it was really relevant, really relevant to the sound of what was happening, at the, to the workflow that was happening, which created that, I would say, that late 70s, early 80s, which is a lot of people would call the golden era. Mm -hmm. Dave Harrison was looking at innovative concepts to put into that console that uh, that resulted in his first Harrison console. There's a major milestone. Yeah, a, a major milestone. He he invented what was the inline console, mm -hmm. and this was unique. You know, before that, you always had these split consoles. You had inputs over here, outputs over there. They tended to be quite mm -hmm. large. A um, lot of extra electronics, a lot of extra cabling, you know, all kinds of issues that were mm -hmm. uh, with these mostly handmade, uh, uh, more behemoth-style consoles. And he had this idea that maybe you could use one of these single channel strips to do both things to actually bring an input in send it out to a tape machine and then have that signal come back into that same physical channel strip right but reroute it so that you could hear it and it sounds simple mm -hmm. at the time it was a big deal it was a major coup because suddenly the consoles you could do a lot more in the physical space. And of course, he was a studio guy. They're building studios and, and real estate, and you know, you need to get as big, big a punch into the space that you have as possible. And suddenly, these consoles, it didn't take long for people to realize that, oh, not only can I record 
and monitor separately, which is really great, all in this, all in this compact mm -hmm. area. But when it comes time to mix, I can use that second path right. as additional inputs to the console, and suddenly the console's got twice as big. Which, which they didn't get twice as big, they could get twice as big, because the yes. split console was the same thing. Right. But when you folded it together and you saved the real estate, suddenly you could do a 32-channel console instead of a split 16 or right. a 48-channel console or a 56-channel console or however big you wanted. And then the number of signal paths that you could have in a mixdown was double. And then he created this status, uh, a FET switching status thing, which automatically configured all the modules simultaneously in whatever status you were working. Am I recording? Do I want to, do I want to record and monitor? Mm -hmm. Can I, do I want to mix? I can go into a mix mode where it separates that and now I have things. So he did this global FET switching on those consoles, which was also unique. And it was mm -hmm. actually critical to the inline design because if you had to go and change every, you know, the status of every channel, it was cumbersome. So he figured out how to do that uh, globally and together, those two things right. were a, a real, really an innovative step in console design. And he was credited that with the AES. He, he became a AES fellow. Yeah, an AES fellow be, because of that. And mm -hmm. um, it was one of the more innovative things that took place in that in that period of time in the industry. <laughs> With all of those consoles, with all the 32Cs all over the world, I know there's iconic productions that everyone knows that have been produced on them. Name a few. Well, you know, uh, here in town, uh, you know, the Oak Ridge Boys, everything that they did in the, in the early 80s was done in their studio up in, up in Hendersonville. Um, elsewhere in Los Angeles, wow. You know, Westlake, Thriller, and Bad, and Off the Wall, Michael Jackson. Mm -hmm. You know, the great 200 Bruce million Whitting. record with the great R.I.P. Bruce Whitting, very good friend of mine. Mm -hmm. uh, Steely Dan records, you know, lots of that early stuff with Roger uh, recording this stuff. Um, mixing probably done elsewhere, but, um, you know, between Donald Fagan and, and these guys, a lot, of, a lot of things done on those Harrison consoles in the early days. And then a little bit later, uh, my two buddies up in Minneapolis, uh, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, who outfitted that studio with a bunch of Harrison consoles and everything they did, uh, you know, just turned into huge success. Janet Jackson, all of Janet Jackson's records from when she was a teenager to now, they mm -hmm. produced and did just sold hundreds of millions of records. And, you know, all the early 90s, uh, uh, that new Jack city sound coming from Minneapolis with Boys to Men and, and uh, uh, George Michael and all those guys that they worked with up there was, was huge. Yeah, a lot, and a lot going on around the world, too. As I said, you know, hundreds of studios had these, you know, Queen and ELO and Sade and all these people who were in the early 80s. Mike Goldfield had a, had a Series 10 in his house for mm -hmm. for a decade and a half and did lots of records on that. He's one of the biggest selling artists outside of the United States in the world mm. in the last 30 years. So there's a lot, go there was a lot going on. It's a pretty rich, pretty rich history. <laughs> we had been out of the, mu the music industry for a while, for a long while, as we talked about, but we still had the we still had the IP, we still had the circuit design, we still have Sam. Sam was the one who, who made these consoles work in the early days. And so we decided that we need to do this again. We need to rebirth this, this Harrison heritage um, with something new, with a, with, a, with a 2020s version of something that had come, you know, many years before and had been successful. And it appears that there is a, an interesting market for it. This is called the 32 Classic. So um, this is the first one. We'll be showing this uh, soon at the AES show. And, you know, a lot of the original design elements of those consoles are in here. Uh, why? Because it was successful. And, mm -hmm. you know, the workflow is really kind of 
uh, evolved around those early uh, workflows, and it really hasn't changed that much. Now, what you're recording to and how you're doing it and right. how you're finishing it has changed greatly. But the basic concept of bringing microphones in, sending them over to a recording device and being able to monitor those things and, and do that workflow really hasn't changed that much. And the studio still needs a flagship. So you, you talk about the classic workflow, but of course this is, this is an informed version yeah. of that classic workflow that yeah. goes for how people are using today. So I know uh, your strong experience in digital comes into play and interfacing that way as well as signal flow to and from the workstations yeah. and, and that. So t talk us through the, the workflow and capabilities, I.O. capabilities. Yeah, there's, uh, there's some unique things here. So we decided that um, getting in and out of the DAW uh, was essential, even if you're going to have an analog front end. And the number of uh, I.O. products out there today is staggering. I mean, there are just hundreds and hundreds of different options out there. And we decided that that that's critical. So we had a lot of experience with our big digital consoles with things like a Maddie and Dante, mm -hmm. and then later on Dante. So in this console, all the converters are built into the console. So out the back of this console is an RJ45. Mm -hmm. And that can plug straight into your DAW of choice. And with a Dante uh, controller, virtual sound card, uh, you can get the audio in and out of this large format analog console very quickly and very easily and very cost effectively mm -hmm. actually the you know think about the wiring that you did in the in the old in the old days <laughs> coming down to a yeah to an rj45 so uh coming in and out of here is is 64 a to d converters uh d to a converters coming in and 64 d to a converters going out so that coupled with a uh, an inline, we have an inline mode that you can use on these, uh, on the input modules, which takes the, the preamp input, and when you go into the inline mode, it takes that and sends it out the direct output via Dante to the DAW. Mm -hmm. So now you have a, a, a straight shot mm -hmm. uh, uh, to your recording, to your DAW. And the return from that then comes back through the fader, so you can monitor it out to, out to buses. So it's kind of a it's kind of a today's inline right. uh, architecture. The, f the feed going to the DAW also has the EQ on it. So typically nowadays people want to EQ while they're, while they're recording. So we did it that way. The, the, the playback coming back, you can put up and monitor and, and hear what's going on. Mm -hmm. So we put that signal flow into the console. Uh, we reduced the number of buses. In the early days, the, the original 32 uh, series console had 32 buses and that typically would mate to a multi-track machine mm -hmm. and it's pretty much not how people work anymore the direct out feeding directly to a NAS is, is a perfect way to do that but we did put eight uh eight buses going out that you can do things with so you can do some parallel processing you can mm -hmm. do uh, some grouping and that kind of thing uh on the console so uh it's a little different architecturally than the original console but it suits much better uh in today's studio on what people are working with uh, out, uh, away from the, in the periphery of the, of the console environment. And it still has that Harrison sound. So what, are, what is the, <laughs> describe the Harrison sound and what makes it unique? It makes it, we spent a lot of time in the early days um, choosing parts and matching, getting things to match, getting mm -hmm. pots to be as accurate as possible. Accuracy was probably the, the word that we would use the, the most, phase accurate. Um, and all those things come about by uh, doing grounding correctly. So I can't tell you exactly how we do that because then I, you know, that's kind of a little bit of a trade here, but grounding is very important. PC board layout, unbelievably important. And we have a guy back there, Sam, who has been here for 50 years, the whole time. And he knows how to do this. And the result of that is uh, lots of copper separation and grounding and all those things that, you know, the techie people don't really think about when you get into the physics of it or make a big deal. And of course, you brought up 5532s and 5534s. And, right. and really, 
knowing how to manipulate the the circuitry around those and 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 those kind of things play a huge role and we've just spent 50 years doing it and it and it works and there's a there's a little bit of a formula in there Mm -hmm. that works really well Uh, on this particular console you know the original original harrison 32 series console had transformers on the on the mic inputs Mm -hmm. and they weren't very good uh, in the early 70s just quite honestly the transformers were not very good um, we, they were there primarily for isolation purposes, not really to, uh, you know, affecting the audio quality was not why they were there. In fact, mm-hmm. everybody tried to engineer that out, and we got rid of transformers as quickly as possible. Dave Harrison didn't didn't want that in the signal path. The whole goal was to make the specifications as good as possible, lowest possible crosstalk, lowest possible noise, phase coherency, all those kind of things which we painstakingly figured out how to do across summing buses and differential uh, circuit designs and those kind of things to get rid of those anomalies because broadcast people early on, they didn't want, you know, they wanted perfect. We were trying to make a digital console out of an analog console. Right. Well, today, you know, we put transformers on this console because they're really good. You know, Jensen mm-hmm. makes really, really nice transformers. So when they're on the front end, not only do you get some isolation, you get a little bit of a you get a little bit of a warmth on there, and that just complements the preamp design really, really well. So the same kind of uh, uh, he surprised himself with a little bit with the with the design of this thing. And then of course the the EQ we just followed the same the same circuit design principle. It's not the same. It's, it's tried not the same. And true. It's and tried proven. and true. Uh, the how the proportional Q thing works. The filters are really good, and, and and they're just you know it's not it's not a lot of rocket science in there, but it's knowing what to do and then just continuing to to keep doing it. And we're using really good converters. The the converters uh, on the Dante network are the the really nice AKM converters. They're as they're as good mm-hmm. as you can buy, and so we spared no expense on on uh, on how IU gets into it, how we route it around. How the grounding schemes work on the output there's also two nice big jensen transformers on, the, on mm. the stereo output as well you can switch them in or switch them out it's a nice little feature so you can, you can kind of a be a, a really well designed mm-hmm. electronically balanced circuit versus something that has some mm-hmm. heavy iron hanging on but that's what people that's what people really want i mean they want to be able to add a little flavor to their to their sounds and <clears throat> Hopefully, we kind of do a little bit of both. It's yeah. extremely clean, phase coherent. You know, all the specifications are, are fantastic. Um, but there's a little bit of iron on the front end and on the back end as well nice. to, to, to help you help the guys along now. We talked about the op amps, and you mentioned the 5532s that we had discussed earlier, which is a fairly old technology now. And there's been generations and generations since then. But as a studio geek... Myself, I will say that there are things that Harrison did with the 5532, which is a dual op amp on a single package, <laughs> that no one else uh, matched. And then you mentioned differential amplifiers, so another geek point, using those as a readily available two op amp package for differential yeah. inputs um, is, I think, part of that Harrison sound. Yeah, it definitely is, and it's something we carried forward. The whole differential thing was was critical. This is common mode rejection. I mean, it's, it's a lot going on there that really helps in the overall performance. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we carried that through to even to the to the digital controlled attenuators that we made. Those were also differential mm-hmm. on the uh, you know the DAX. Right. Were were dual. They were dual right. DAX, and you could. You could do a little common mode so there was no zipper noise or any of those all those weird artifacts that might have happened didn't because we we really perfected how how to use that how to do the differential uh so you're both in and out so electronically balanced stuff was was a big big key to the to the sound of these consoles what was happening inside also of course you got to know how to do a summing bus and you ground i can't emphasize how how the grounding scheme, how important that is mm-hmm. inside a large piece of, uh, of analog equipment. It's absolutely critical. And we 
discovered early on how to mitigate those grounding issues by mm -hmm. having multiple of them by separating things and, and having paths of least resistance um, for various different parts of the design. And it's a, it's a unique way of doing it, and it really absolutely um, contributes to the, to the sound or mm -hmm. possibly the lack thereof mm -hmm. of the sound. Of the, you know, what you don't hear is also part of what you hear. You've got the 32 Classic in this configuration, which is um, is 32 faders. Are there what's what's in the future? Are there other configurations? Are there other? Well, we will do one bigger than this with 48 channels, and anything beyond that, I think, would would be a custom build. So mm -hmm. uh, we can talk about making them as big as we want, but commercially, I think a 32 and a 48 makes a lot of sense. Anything else in the future you want to give? A me? lot, but not much I can. <laughs> <laughs> really talk about now but yeah we have a roadmap we this is one of the things that our our new partners brought to the table is really sitting down and having a real good look at at uh intellectual property and we have 50 years of stuff that we've made and technologies that we have and now we're trying to figure out how to how to take those and and really uh you know really bring them back to the forefront or utilize them in, in different ways to to monetize some of that stuff so um yeah we we are making a roadmap this is the first part of it and there's more to come and both software and and hardware yeah okay. it's exciting times i'll leave it at leave it at that well gary it's been great getting uh in, in the insights into the era where before yeah. i first met harrison and uh through that period and what you're doing now thank you very much yeah my pleasure and and you're always welcome here frank you're you're nearby down the road and yeah it's good. We're, we've been here. We will continue to be here. So okay. good to talk, buddy. Yeah.